Hi, I'm Devon. Welcome to West B. Interested in knowing more about the proposed 2022 budget? We will meet tonight at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary for our quarterly business meeting, which will include a time of questions and answers about the proposed budget. We will vote next Sunday, November the 14th in all worship centers. Ready to learn more about our church and what we believe? Join us for our membership class on Sunday, November the 21st at 1045 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. You can let us know you're attended by signing up at join.westb.org. We look forward to meeting you there. Our next luncheon will be on November the 19th in the Fellowship Hall at 10.30 a.m. We will have a catered Thanksgiving meal and fun fall activities. Please sign up for this fellowship at the welcome desk today or in your life groups on Sunday, November the 14th. Please invite your friends to come out and enjoy the time together. Hey, everyone, let's praise God for all the people who were here for Treat Street. It was awesome. I was able to be Paul and tell the gospel story to hundreds of people. Far as the eye could see, we're on the campus, meeting friends, hearing the gospel, and of course, getting candy. What a fun time. And maybe some of you here today were our guests at Treat Street. Church, can we welcome our guests and praise God for a great night? Come on. Well, that's it for now. Let's worship together. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, Spirit, when you move. When you fill the room, you're here. 
There is one area of our spiritual lives I believe we plan more for failure than we do success. And ironically, it's the one area where we should be most optimistic. It's evangelism, which means us sharing our faith. It's us inviting people to hear about Jesus. And a lot of people don't share or invite because they fear really two things, failure or rejection. Now, when we're talking about sharing our faith and we're talking about evangelism, this fear of failure kind of comes across as, you know, what, what if I don't share the gospel correctly? I think, I think some people fear that. Like, I, you know, I, I want to make sure I get it right. But I think more people fear rejection. What if this person rejects the gospel? Or what if the person I'm talking to rejects me? These are important questions, and they're actually going to be questions that we're going to help answer uh, in the text today as we look at three more disciples. But I want to begin with this thought, because I think this particular thought can help you as you think about you sharing your faith and, and reaching out to others. Devotion to God is never failure. It's not. 2 Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth to show himself strong for those who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. God isn't looking for the strongest. God's not looking for the most eloquent. God is not looking for the most popular or the best looking. He's looking for the most devoted. If you are devoted to him, you won't fail at least in your devotion. And I think that's an important concept for all of the spiritual endeavors that we have in our life. And we're going to see this in the disciples today. So who, who were the early followers of Jesus? Specifically, who are the 12 disciples? We've been in this series for several weeks now, and today we're going to be looking at the beginning of John's gospel, and Jesus is going to select four disciples in this text. Three of them are named. They're the ones we're going to be looking at today. Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew, as also known as Nathaniel. So we're going to call him Nathaniel today. Maybe you've heard him as Bartholomew in the past. Again, one is his given name, the other is his nickname. We'll also be seeing Andrew and Philip. But I want to take you to the text, and it's going to be a text of people bringing others to Jesus. Love this passage. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. Go get those Bibles, turn them on, open them up. Let's read God's Word together. John 1, verse 35. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by. He said, look, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and noticed them following him, he asked them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Can anything good come out, come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus responded, do you believe because I told you I saw you under a fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and de descending on the Son of Man. Now, in essence, what is happening here? is Jesus is telling people, telling us through the story of these early disciples, that he doesn't want people to, 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 um, to just like him. Jesus wants people to follow him. You see, we're not 
fans of Jesus, we're followers of Jesus, we're disciples. So as this text talks about, you, you see John the Baptist with two of his disciples, specifically here in verse 35 where we began. One of them is Andrew, we see that in verse 40, and the other is not named. And it's most likely John the Beloved, the author uh, of, of this particular gospel. Uh, the New Testament writers often did not identify themselves in the text, so it makes sense that the fourth and unnamed disciple is John, the one who wrote this particular book. And, and we see the, uh, the humility of, of John the Baptist here. So different than the other John. It's kind of confusing sometimes with all the Johns in the Bible, but there's the humility of John the Baptist because it's rare for a teacher to pass off students to another rabbi or another teacher. And, and that's what happens here. And it's a clear sign that John the Baptist knew that Jesus was superior and John the Baptist had an idea that this is the Messiah. It's also unusual for a rabbi to initiate a relationship. So we see that Jesus finds Philip in verse 43. But that's how God works. He, he starts the process. He starts regeneration. The, the Holy Spirit changes us. The Holy Spirit transforms us. Without a work of God, we can't be saved. Now, I want you to notice something here, and this is just fascinating to me, and I realized that there was a, a lot going on in the text, and a lot of people getting other people and bringing them to Jesus, which is kind of the whole point. So, but, but it happens in different ways. So I, I want you to, to, to take note of this. You have Andrew and John, and they are they come to know who Christ is through preaching, specifically the preaching of John the Baptist. So there are those who will get saved through methods like preaching. And then you have Peter. Peter in this text, his, his brother, Andrew, he goes and gets, gets him. Philip hears directly from Jesus. We have a direct call from God himself. And then Nathaniel, well, God uses a friend, um, Philip, to, to come bring him to Jesus. And Philip uh, and Nathaniel are likely close companions. So I say all this to tell you there's one way to God. It's through Christ. But people will come to know Jesus in many different ways and through many different methods and through many different means. And I think that's important because God will use anybody in any circumstance to save people. So here's our faith. Our faith is that God saves, but we follow. And then we share. And then God saves someone else, and then we repeat the process. So when you're found by God, you follow. And when you follow, you share. Then others get found. All of this happens because we're devoted. We're devoted to the mission of God. Now, there is this wonderful aspect of salvation and that we're saved. We're saved by Jesus. But devotion to Christ comes with a cost as well. Grace is free. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and this grace is free. There's nothing we do to earn it. But we must count the cost of discipleship. You know, people will look for um, many things from Jesus, and uh, we'll, we'll call these uh, frivolous followers, people who are not um, serious about the, their, their faith. Um, and, you know, Jesus, Jesus tells them in verse 50, you're, you're going to see greater things. And Jesus would draw crowds. There would be thousands of people that would come see him perform miracles or hear him teach, at least about, up until about halfway through his ministry. But he didn't want to be known as just a miracle worker. He wanted to be known as the Messiah. And he wanted people to know him on his terms, not their terms. So there were people in the crowd that were there, and they weren't very serious. They didn't count the cost. And I'll, I'll call these frivolous followers. I, I don't mean to imply motive too much here, other than the fact that they weren't serious. So when I say frivolous, I just mean not serious. They, they liked the things that Jesus was doing, but they really weren't devoted to following him. And the first kind of frivolous follower, the follower that we see in the Gospels is, uh, is the antagonist. Um, they, these are the ones that are there to cause trouble, like the priests and the Levites. In fact, we see that in John chapter 1 and, and verse 19. They're there 
not for the most purest of intentions. So you have the first kind of frivolous follower, which is the antagonist. But then we have those who are more there for the spectacle, and they're the spectators. And they're driven by curiosity. They, they're there to watch a show. They're there as part of the crowd. And, you know, who knows what their motive is, but they're just there to see. The third type of frivolous, frivolous follower is the know-it-all. And we see a lot of this today. That, you know, people aren't, there are some people who desire to be in church or in the Word um, or to claim Christ, not, not because they're all out devoted to Jesus, but rather they're driven by knowledge. That's not a serious follower of Christ. That's a frivolous follower of Christ, even if you're deep into God's word. So there are also those who just want to gather information from Jesus so um, that they can be right and, and prove others wrong. Um, and that's not exactly the greatest motive either. A disciple here is under a rabbi. You don't just, and, and in the context of the, the era, in the context of the time, you, you don't just learn from, but rather you adhere to the teaching. So it isn't just gaining knowledge in order to use knowledge as a weapon. It's also applying it appropriately and living it out. A fourth, so you get the know-it-all. The other kind of frivolous followers, those who are just self-interested. I just, you know, I just need to hang around Jesus so I can feel better about myself. And, you know, I, I kind of feel for those who want Jesus in that way because maybe they're seeking something or fill the void, but the only way Christ is going to fill that void is if you completely surrender to him. Jesus isn't there just to make you feel better about yourself. He's there to save you and to save you from your sins. So these types of followers, if, if you're a frivolous follower, it makes following about you, where you are the center. And, and that's where we get it wrong. And again, maybe you're there, maybe you've been there, and you've kind of wondered, like, why, this Christi- why is this Christianity thing not working for me? Well, are you at the center? Are you trying to pursue God where you're in the middle of it all? Or are you trying to pursue God where he's in the middle of it all? Because when Jesus says, follow me, and he says it here in this text, this isn't, you, know, you can't just want the benefit without the cost of commitment. You don't get the benefit of salvation without the cost of commitment. You can't just want the goods of the Father, but not the Father himself. When Jesus says, follow me, what he's telling you is you can't be in control of your life. You have to be devoted to the way that is Christ. And this is, this is kind of a hurdle to the gospel. You know, if if I submit to Jesus, then he might ask me to do something that I don't want to do. Well, of course he will. <laughs> of course he will. The, the idea of I'll obey him if, if, if you have an if in your statement, I'll obey Jesus if, you're not a disciple. You're a frivolous follower. Nathaniel's under the fig tree here in verses 47 through 49. There's a lot that's been said about um, Nathaniel under the fig tree. It's a bit of a mystery in the text. And, and I love these texts because you know, you'll read one commentary and some great scholar will say something. You'll read another commentary and another great scholar will say something. And they all have good points and it's all well thought out. But ultimately, it's a bit of speculation. And so these texts are fun because there is, um, there's edification and diving in deep to the mysteries of God. And it is a bit of mystery. What was Nate doing under the tree? Well, whatever it was it was most likely that he was getting rest by being in the shade. So the reason you would sit under a tree in a desert climate like this is to get out of the sun. And what is Jesus doing? Jesus calls him out of the spot of rest so that he can follow him. He calls Nathaniel uh, to move from a place of comfort to a place of discomfort. It's what the prophet Amos reminds us of in his book. Woe to those who are at ease. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure. We are not doing church right unless following Jesus comes with a cost. Found followers find others who need to know Jesus. That's our calling. Now, how did the first followers identify Jesus. You see here several different ways 
that they identify Jesus. Verse 38, he's a teacher. In verse 41, he's claimed as the Messiah. In verse 45, he's the fulfillment of the law. And in verse 49, he's called the Son of God, the King of Israel. They knew immediately there was something unique about Jesus. And so Jesus says, verse 39, come and see. What does Philip say? In verse 46, come and see. Jesus didn't tell them everything. And I think this is a struggle for some people because for some of us, and I think I, I can be this way a little bit, is I want to know that I know that I know. I want to know everything up front so that I can make the best decision possible. And I get that. I can understand why people would feel that way or think that way. But here's the challenge. Jesus doesn't tell you everything up front. He can't. He's God. God knows everything. He can't reveal everything to you all at once. You couldn't handle it. So there are veils in your life. God will lift that veil. God will lift that uh, that thing that's in front of you that you know you're not supposed to know what's next until it's there. And, and so there, there are some big implications here to what Jesus means. Come and see. Come. You, you must move from where you are to someplace new. So keep that in mind. In order, you to, in order for you to find God, in order for you to keep finding God, you have to keep moving to someplace new. So our faith is one of movement, not being stagnant. But then see, come and see. Something needs to be revealed to you. God has to reveal. So come and see. You've got to be on the move, and God has to reveal it to you. And, and this is our, our life. This is our, people say, spiritual journey. It's such a cliche, but it's true. We're on a spiritual journey. Well, come and see. You've got to move, and God has to reveal something to you. So what are you looking for? What are you centered on now? What pulls you in more than anything else? And I hope that it's Christ himself. I hope that your life is centered on Christ. Now, here's the thing about Andrew and Peter. We've talked about Peter in this series. Now we're talking about his brother, Andrew. And Andrew and Peter owned a, a home together, and they operated a, a fishing operation together. Uh, in John chapter 1, they appear to have taken a break from their fishing business to go into the wilderness and to hear from John the Baptist. So uh, they, they're running this business. They hear about this guy out in the wilderness. All right, let's put the business on hold. Let's get out there. Let's hear from this prophet because apparently there's something to this. And Andrew goes and gets his brother Simon or Peter here in verse 41. And then Philip goes and finds his friends in verse 45. So there's this movement, there's this idea of going and getting people and sharing what you know, which in our context today is evangelism, sharing the faith, sharing what you believe. So who are you bringing in? Who are you inviting in? If Jesus is the gravitational center of your life, you should be pulling others towards him and into the body that is the church. Christ is the head, we are the body. And so if Jesus is in the middle, he is the, the gravitational force that's pulling people in, and that happens through us, the church. So don't miss this. Don't miss this. Christianity starts with a couple of average guys telling friends and family about Jesus. Now let that sink in. How does this whole idea of Christianity begin? A few normal dudes just going and getting their friends. That's how it begins. How does Christianity continue today? The same way. The same way. Let God do the work of converting. He's the one who saves. You don't, you don't save anybody. God saves people. It's through Christ that people are saved. But you must do the work of telling others. When was the last time you told someone, challenged them, invited them in with, come and see. Jesus knows everyone. They just need to know him. Verse 48, Nathaniel, under the fig tree. How do you know me? Now, this is not some cheap trick of clairvoyance. In verse 51, the very last verse that, that we looked at today, 
Jesus actually references Jacob's ladder, which we find in Genesis 28 if you want to go back and read what Jacob's ladder is about. Jacob's ladder has the scene of angels ascending and descending. And you know, at the time it was written, uh, at the time Genesis was written, uh, and then throughout the Old Testament and all of history, there was a lot of confusion as to what exactly was this vision of Jacob? And it is this Jacob's ladder and angels going up and down this ladder. And what, what does that mean? Well, we find the fulfillment in Christ. We find the answer in who Jesus is here in John chapter 1. And what Jesus is saying is, I am the link between heaven and earth. Frankly, it's an unlikely link. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked. Well, Jesus tells us here, to see heaven opened, you have to follow me. Jesus says, I am the mediator between heaven and earth. It is Jesus who is the center of the universe. Jesus came down Jacob's ladder so that you can go up into the heavens. And to experience heaven, you can't just be hanging around. You can't just be part of the crowd. To see heaven opened up, you've got to be a disciple. So God invites us in. Come and see. Now, we have the responsibility to go and tell. You know, our culture often celebrates the biggest and the most profound, and um, everyone loves a top 10 list. You know, it's why we have bestseller lists, and it's why YouTube, uh, YouTube views are kind of front and center. Whenever you ever look at a video, you often, well, how many views does it have? It's the same in ministry. The most consequential are often the most influential. That's not the way it is in God's kingdom. The greatest value in God's kingdom is one. Now, I want to show you a picture. It's a picture of... Uh, of someone that I've never met, but it's someone I know. Uh, his name is Ambrose Gilbert Sapp. He was a local church pastor who toiled in obscurity among the rolling fields of Kentucky, shepherding God's people in poverty, and he did so without any glory or recognition. He preached, he died, and he was forgotten. But my wife knows Jesus because of him. Ambrose Gilbert Sapp is her grandfather. He never preached to crowds. His churches were small and rural congregations. He shared the gospel with one person at a time. Year after year, people got saved. The disciple Andrew was like this. He was the one-on-one -on -one disciple. After he meets Jesus, he goes and gets his brother Peter. When Jesus tested his disciples right before he fed thousands, it was Philip who questioned where they would find the money. If you look at Philip in John 1, we found the Messiah. By the time Philip is in John 14, I'm struggling to figure out who you are, Jesus. And then Philip in John 6, where are we going to find the money for this, Jesus? So Philip had some ups and downs. And what did Andrew do in that scene where Jesus was about to feed thousands? What did Andrew do? He brought one child to Christ. This child had five barley loaves and two fish. And what did Jesus do? Jesus performed a miracle through the one. We at West Bradenton, we are a neighborhood church for the nations. Reaching hundreds of homes around us is a big task. It's monumental. Reaching the nations, a neighborhood church for the nations, this is an immense undertaking. We're talking billions of people. But God's kingdom grows one by one. Who is right in front of you? Who do you know that needs Jesus? Who can you invite to church? The greatest value in God's kingdom is one. You know, it's something to think about billions of people. And it's hard to grasp that. But everyone, including you, 
can grasp one, go find your one. Bring them to Christ. Come and see.